Block's musical repair in Lake Elsinore with Mr. Block, owner of the uh, establishment, and my good buddy here, Chris, uh, Chris Walton from the Barstow Prophets. And we're going to take a little rundown on a lot of the instruments he used in the recording of his new album, which is maybe coming out... Do we know when? Yeah, it'll be out in a week. So the the Barstow Prophet's second CD, which is entitled "Just a Music, Just American Music," is the name of the CD. Um, and Joe, thanks for the invitation to to do the video piece. Um, when you called about it, I couldn't think of a better place than right here at Mr. Block's shop because he's kind of the wizard behind my instruments. So I want to give the guy credit. This is my first time in here, and I'm amazed with the history that you have just walking around in here. <laughs> I can't imagine the amount of instruments or the dudes that have walked through here. Sure. Mr. Block, so how many years have you been re repairing guitars? Oh, geez, I started in my 20s and I'm 80, so quite a while. You've done a yeah. few of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I met Mr. Block about eight years ago um, when I was playing with the 4019s, and I had a I found a real nice old guitar, but it had major problems. And so I asked somebody in town, you know, like, who, do you know anyone who can fix this? And they said, there's this guy out in Lake Elsinore um, who has a shop. If you can, you know, call Mr. Block and see if he'll take a look at your guitar. And, and that's how we started about eight years ago. And ever since then, this is the only place I bring my guitars and he's fixed everything for me. Well, why would you have this here? Tell us a little bit about what we've got here. I mean, I've seen you play this a million times. I don't know anything about the history of it. Sure. Um, so this is my number one. Um, I found this guitar about five years ago. It's a 1979 Gibson Les Paul Custom uh, 2550. Yeah, can we, can we like, sure. let's get it up there. It's a 2550 anniversary model. Um, great guitar. Uh, depending upon who you believe, they made about a thousand of them. Um, I, I've always played Les Pauls. I love the tone. I always play, pretty much every guitar solo I play is always out of the neck pickup right up here. Um, it's heavy, but it has a beautiful sound. Series 7 pickups, which are very dark and bassy. Um, a really good example of this guitar would be on our first CD, the song 6AM in Charlotte. You can hear this guitar really well. And also this is the guitar I played the solo on for a song called Blue Plate Special on the first CD. Um, I, always, I take it to every show. I play it almost every show. I play it on every CD. It's, it's been number one for a long time. Three-piece neck in the back. Um, you know, I have terrible uh, hand position with my thumb, so I run the finish off pretty bad here. And Really, my thumb should be more in the middle rather than up on the top, but that's just sort of my fault. Um, and then I, as soon as, like everything else, when I, as soon as I found it um, on the road, um, I brought it to Mr. Block and he sort of did his magic to it. So, uh, Chuck, you remember what you did to this one? Well, first we put the middle pickup in, which meant routing a hole and uh, lining it up nicely. We put the new bridge on because you were breaking strings. I leveled what they call dress the frets, which is running one of these blocks to make them level. I highlight them, take off the highlight and all the wear. Then I have to reshape them with these special rounded files. Then I sand them, then I buff them on the big wheel over there. Time consuming, but necessary on most guitars. And we cleaned it up and buffed it. So the beautiful thing yeah. about, about this guitar is that it, it shows exactly the age it should. The old Gibsons you know, they had that nitro lacquer finish, and by now... Those, I love the cracking. In yeah, the cracking is yeah. is what you should see, and, the, and this lacquer finish is cracked all over the place. They don't look real unless they have that crack. So at all Gibson, they just don't look right. What size strings are you playing on here? You know, I've, I play 10s on or all the electrics. Know? Yeah. Uh, so D'Addario 10s, although um, we for a little while we had a deal with uh, blacksmith strings, and we're trying to sort of sort that off, sort that out. The company changed hands. I like those too, but D'Addario 10s are always what I put on. And Mr. Block sets up all my guitars. The action is exactly the same. The feel is exactly the same. I can switch from one to one to one, and they all feel identical. And they feel good, yeah. Yep. So uh, that's number one. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> like, like you said, you'll, you're going to see this at almost every show that I play. 
Um, the next one is a guitar that I've been playing with you and that you saw probably in the next year. Oh yeah. So this is a... Uh, Old Red. Yeah. <laughs> this is currently number two. And um, I found this guitar in Boulder, Colorado last last year sometime and and it was just sort of uh, it had seen a lot of love and hate um, and it was in really bad shape this is a 73 Gibson ES 335 it's got the matching embossed pickups um, it still has the original cherry finish all the binding is yellow just like it was supposed to but um, I had to bring it to, to Mr. Block for the, the tailpiece and a bunch of other things that he did to it. Chuck, do you remember what I you did to this one? I don't remember what we did. So right away I noticed... We put the tailpiece on. We took a something out of here. Yeah, well, there was a there stud was a, or a stop tailpiece. Somebody had taken the original trapeze off and put a stop tailpiece into it. They, uh, almost kind of, like a Les Paul or something. Right, and yeah. they kind of butchered it, I mean, which is typical. <laughs> yeah, it was a DIY project. <laughs> yeah. In the garage, someone did it in the but garage. But it actually, I mean, it sort of adds character. It does. You know? It does, and, and they also dropped the guitar because yeah. down here you'll see this white binding is all replacement. And, you know, obviously they took some sort of lacquer thinner to the finish probably, here. They've got a big patch right here, yeah. too. Yeah, so it's... um. Like I said, it's seen a lot of it. The, uh, I need to straighten that bridge up a little bit. It's leaning forward. Right. <laughs> and then this is one of the guitars that Mr. Um, uh, oh, the other thing is he put, remember he put the brass nut on for me? Okay. Um, which I really like because whether it's true or not, I always think it gives the guitar a lot more resonance and tone. Um, but this is definitely one of the guitars where he did a truss rod adjustment. And I, to this day, I still don't know exactly what that means, but. Well, there's a rod in here, and if you imagine it bent like this, so that when you tighten it, it straightens out, and if your neck is curved, it takes the curve out of the neck. The what? newer guitars work both ways. If you have what they call a reverse arc, which is this way, it's gonna buzz all over down here, you loosen the rod in the newer guitars and it starts retightening even though you're going backwards and it drives that reverse arc out, which is neat. These older guitars I have to put a heating device on and clamp and shim and reshape the wood. Oh to yeah. Get, to get that a do not have arc. a truss rod. Or, most of us are a little most of us are a little timid or a little scared <laughs> to be like adjusting our truss rods and right? stuff. That's when we call a guy like Mr. Block to say, hey, you know. Do we need a quarter turn on this or do we need... And then on, on the back of this guitar, again, all the all the lacquers come off the neck. Nice nice mahogany neck on the back. Um, you know, it's, it's got some pretty big chunks taken out of the headstock, but you know, most of the, the finish is original and, and, and like you've seen, Joe, you know, these are not, I'm not a guitar collector. I just like playing the old stuff and if it gets another scratch or it gets another bump or it gets another ding, <laughs> yeah. hey, that's kind of the price you pay. So I don't... So this is not frameable, but it's playable. That's the thing. Yeah. All the guitars have to sound great and they have to play great. That's my only two criteria. Sounds great, plays great. Um, you know, if it's if it's starting to crack here on the body or it's got these other... It almost looks like from water or... Right. Like it got damp. Well, that's our next one. Was... <laughs> This was not the one in the fire. No, 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 that's that's the next one I'll, I'll show you. But So this guitar I used a lot on the new CD. Um, there's a song on the CD called Raining in New Orleans that starts with a guitar riff. That's this guitar. Um, I never thought I would be a 335 hollow body player, but the, car, the guitar just has a great tone. Um, like, for example, when we do your song, Kayla, you know, I love to play this guitar on that song. I love this guitar. Yeah, I think this has a beautiful tone. Every time I've heard it, I just, I love it. But I do have sort of a fascination for 335s, too. Right. And These guitars have a solid block of wood down the middle, which lets you play them louder without feet. Without, yeah. Right. All right, so now I'll show you the, the guitar that was in the fire. When you're adjusting a uh, neck on a guitar, this little gauge tells me where the arc is and so on. Oh yeah, can we demonstrate that? Now you put it on here, 
And I, I actually want this, this neck's almost a little straighter than it needs to be. I want this needle straight up is totally level. I want some a little bit of arc, so I want the needle over between the red notches. And, ooh, this is a short neck. A little shorter. Yeah, we need to readjust this one. It's a little yeah, because we you want a little. It'll buzz a little bit if it's too straight. So this is a 1963 Gibson ES125 TDC. T means thin, D means double cutaway, uh, it means dual pickup, and C means cutaway. Um, same thing, shows exactly the age it should. All the binding is yellow. Nice cherry finish on the back. And that's, a, that's an old sunburst finish. But if you smell it, the guitar smells like smoke. <laughs> Wild um, nightclubs. <laughs> well, we think that yeah. the, we the think years. the guitar was in a fire. I was told uh, it was in a house fire, and so we're wondering. We've always wondered if this is water yeah. damage from the inside. It looks like water damage. Right put here. the fire out. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it maybe got filled up with water. And so when I brought it to Mr. Block, uh, this pickup was in pieces, and we threw a tunematic bridge on it. But the big issue was he wound up having to take the neck off. Remember doing this? Uh, yeah, yeah. So he just calls me up one day and says, Chris, <laughs> the guitar's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. Tell him what you had to do to the neck. Does this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, if I remember, I would have probably put a, a large drywall screw in there after I forced some glue in. That's the only reason I would do that plug, right? Yep. My memory's not what it used to be, so uh, <laughs> people ask me, you remember what I, you did to my guitar six months ago? And I, I usually tell them I don't remember what I did last week, but I still know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you find this feeds back yeah. a lot more than the 335? Sure, and, yeah. and, and, I, and I, I actually use that. Um, so I was amazed when he sent me pictures where he'd taken the neck completely off. And we found that maybe there were some water damage in the joint, but he was able to rebuild the joint and put it back together. And now the seal on the neck is just unbelievably good. I mean, everywhere, it's just, the work is just incredible on it. I'm trying to remember why I offset that uh, strap button. Because I, because of the way I wear my strap. Okay. Um, but I mean, it's not centered on the back of the heel. Yeah. So, because there's no center block in this, when you go high volume, um, it will feed back like crazy. So you have to make sure you're faced straight out to the audience. Oh yeah. Because if you turn back towards you don't your amp, toward your amp, or but if you get good, you can actually use that feed, use your feedback. Use your feedback. So like many times, like I'll play. Um, I love to play this guitar if we're you know if the band sort of starts playing blues, if we're playing BB King, if we're playing. Um, you know, and anything like that, or sometimes I'll also uh, use this if we're playing Hendrix, like if we're playing Red House, or um, if we're playing Hey Joe, something like that, uh, where I want a real big, you know, thick tone that I can get out of it. It's a, it's a beautiful blues guitar. Now so, I noticed on here, you have the magnets like dialed up really high, just for extra pickup? This pickup doesn't pick up as good well as this one because the string vibrations wider over that pickup so you always see the neck pickup lower than the bridge and this is just helping get that up oh, okay. because these this type of pickup you can't raise the whole thing with this screw like you can on the newer guitars so you uh, use the magnets and this is the only guitar that I have a um, pick guard on I don't like pick guards they just they, we can take it off. I, I know. <laughs> it's just mentally they get in my way, but for some reason, I think it's because of how high the strings are. Like this is this pickup has got a spacer underneath it. Right. Um, it just doesn't bother me. But all the other guitars, no pick guards, don't like them. So this is uh, this guitar uh, we used a lot on the first CD. So if you were to hear a song like, for example, Dead Man's Blues, which is that sort of John oh, Lee, yeah. John Lee Hooker song that we play. Um, that's this guitar. The Devil Wears a Skirt. That's this guitar. Um, it's, you know, it's just sort of got that great 
sound to it. Uh, what year was this one? This is a 63. This is a 63, and we know that because the hollow bodies are all stamped inside, and it's pretty easy to find uh, to find the date. Um, so, yep, we f I found this up again. The this this spacer here is to get that pickup closer to the strings, like I was talking. About. Oh yeah. And Mr. Block usually takes out this. There's usually a wooden bridge here, but you can't really dial up the intonation the way you want yeah. unless you put the tunematic on. So uh, he's got about two million parts here. It's usually not too hard to find something. And I think this is the way to go. Is this because this is just a freestanding bridge? Well, tell me a trick yeah. that this he will, use. This will well, move around, right? If you take yeah, your strings out. They, or... Yeah, they'll also move if you bump them. But I usually put a piece of uh, sandpaper glued to the bottom this way, you know, to where you you would have to physically try to move that with the tension of the strings on it. It'll move if you uh, if you unstring it, yeah, it'll it'll come right off. And you have to make yeah, sure that's you get it in the right place when you restring it. So you know Joe, in pretty much every show we start, uh, the shows with maybe five or six songs where I would I would usually play a traditional acoustic guitar. But about five years ago I found these Gibson thick um, acoustic electrics and now I'm totally sold on them. This is a 1954 ES150 um, single pickup and I found this uh, guitar up in Montebello, California, brought it to Mr. Block but we had a problem with it. The original pickup that came with it, the guitar had been stored in an attic and it had been subject to a lot of heat Surprising, the finish is still as good. Right, but the plastic within the pickup had melted, so the pickup was dead. And Mr. Block sent it out, and you know, then he did a whole bunch of work to it. What did you do? Well, we put in this replacement pickup, which I wish they'd use two screws on one side so it wouldn't wiggle around like that. Uh, we changed the capacitor on the uh, tone control, cleaned the pots did something to the output jack, which is where you plug in. Uh, did we replace this bridge too? It looks like it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Better bridge. Uh, put new buttons on the keys. A lot of Gibsons and, and Gretches. These keys will atrophy and they'll literally crumble in your hand when you try to turn them. I've noticed that like with a lot of those old tuners. We should make these look older. You know, you can, you can you can turn them, but they're not turning the string at all. You know, they just yeah, they're they've come loose on the inside. It's that old. And so like, how did how do these um, are they, do these stay in tune a little better? Well, basically, all that's for is to turn it. The uh, the the keys were in good shape themselves, but the buttons were all trash. So these yeah. are just new buttons. Oh, I see. Which I have to take this. Uh, tool with a really tiny bit on it and fit each one individually to fit the shaft that I super glue them on. The, so, the original buttons are made out of Bakelite plastic and after 30 or 40 years or 50 years, especially if they're exposed to heat, the Bakelite shrinks and then it crumbles. So well, there's a good example. Uh, we had a couple of them breaking off and I just told them go ahead and replace all the buttons. And I love how these are still sort of period. That's what we. You know what I mean? Uh, they, they match the the old time tuners. We, we could yellow them up a little more to where they match the trim a little better. Can you yellow them? How do you yellow them? Uh, he knows every I trick. have different kinds of stains. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes iodine, just iodine rubbed on. Everybody them. wants something old now. Yeah, right. you're right. What, and what do you what do you glue them in with? I use super glue. Just I have regular three super or glue. four different. Thicknesses of super glue. Yeah. From runny like water to super thick. And you had mentioned the finish on this. It's really because nice. Because the finish it, on this, what year is this it one? Does it's 54. It's a 54. This is a 54. And look at that thing. It still shines. Well, it's this is gorgeous. This is the guitar that literally, you know, was under the bed for 30 years or in the closet or. Uh, yeah. This one wound up in the attic. Actually, kind of. Probably, oh, yes, probably the worst thing for a guitar. 
to not be played to sit under a bed or sit in an attic for 30 years. But I'd like to find some old fenders that they've done that with because they can't be destroyed if you run over them with a truck. <laughs> you know, so and they would be worth a ton. Another trick on this one is, and Joe, you just saw and pointed it out, is again, another brass nut. I just think that that makes the guitar really ring. Um, so we're waiting, we've sent the pickup out to be rewired and we're going to try and get the original pickup back and, and drop it back in here. This pickup is a little bassier than I like, but still, you know, does the job, plays, plays yeah. really well. So, for example... And you can it, probably dial that in on a board or something. We can, you, exactly. Yeah. So, it's a great song, it's a great guitar. If, if we're going to play, you know, if we're going to play Bertha, The Grateful Dead, if we're going to play um, some Dylan, Tangled Up in Blue, if we're going to play I Know You Rider, um, the guitar plays beautifully, sounds beautiful. It's got a great look on stage. Um, so now, why would you be honest? Uh, any special reason for humbucker here? Why not like a P90 or something That's like that? That's what I had with a P90, it, isn't it? Yeah, it had, originally it came with a P90, which is actually That's what brighter. We're doing yeah. very well. Um, but I had read some good reviews about this pickup. This is. A Seymour Duncan uh, Seth Lover um, pickup, and everyone said that it had really good clarity. What I should have realized, though, is it, it's clear, but it is kind of bassy. Yeah. And I like acoustic guitars to have that brighter acoustic sound. So we will we'll swap it out at some point. But for right now, I mean, it's it works. It's absolutely yeah. does a great job. Does and a it great, looks great, job. And it and it looks great. It's just a spectacular guitar. Um, all right. This is a uh, this is a 1967 Dobro uh, D12 um, in the Grunes book they call it the Columbia. Um, I love the sound of this guitar. Um, I've used it on every CD. Um, it's been at times sort of a nightmare for Mr. Block <laughs> working on the cone, working on the volumes, <laughs> stringing it. Yeah, stringing it. Um, Hate slotted headstocks. Oh, it takes you twice as long <laughs> to put strings on. All maple neck on the back, and uh, everybody has a different opinion about the body. I think it's rosewood, but I'm not sure. Um, the uh, neck adjustment in the back is interesting, where you can re-angle the neck. Oh, that really is bring interesting. Bring the neck up to the strings or down. So if you bring the neck. So does this have a does this have a truss rod? Yes. Yeah, it has a truss rod, but it's actually a like a bolt-on. A bolt-on neck, neck, almost. Neck. I'm pretty sure. Otherwise, it wouldn't have that screw that yeah. makes it different. You wouldn't see this gap back here either. But that is really unique That's, that you can make yeah. a neck adjustment from the. Sure. So what I can line. do is I can I can be playing chords like on the new on the new album. I play this on a uh, song called Shamrock. But I can also then. <laughs> drop the neck down and then I can just get out my glass slide and I can just play it like a straight up dobro. Oh, that's, that's, that's what that's for. That's what that's oh, for okay. is to change it. So it's really kind of two instruments in one. Um, and then... I don't uh, want to get wild. They make a, uh, they make a nut that raises, sits right over the, this nut and raises the strings up. If you wanted to just use it for a slide. Yeah. And then how, what is the assembly inside the cone, Mr. Block? You know, I'm not sure what this one has. They have a variety of them. Some have three different deals sitting in there. This one is probably like the one on the door over there. It's really hard to, to tell. I'm sure this is like that. And then they have a... Uh, so it's a single cone. Yeah, and this they have this device that reaches out in every direction and sits on the lip. <coughs> that one's upside down on the one. It'd be the other Looks way. Looks like around. a little hubcap. Yeah. So the device, the main piece is called the spider, right? Uh they have a lot of different terms for those things. And I've seen a lot of different I just worked on one that had the the three and it was a incredibly loud all metal body with engraving all over it. Yeah. That, which I, I've seen those, um, you know, Dobro's are, they're, Dobro's the brand name. It's, it's a resonator. Right. Yeah, resonator, resonator guitars. Yeah. Yeah. The resonators, the steel bodies, man, they're just too heavy for me. That's a super heavy instrument. 
this is this is pretty light and this records beautifully. Um, Dave Newton up at our studio, up at his studio, Roller Coaster uh, in Burbank, loves to see this guitar because he just puts a um, a direct mic on it, and then he puts an ambient mic in the back of the room. We never take it electric, and it, oh, it yeah. just has a fantastic sound in the studio. The one thing I find with most of these guitars, they don't have a lot of down angle from the bridge to the tailpiece. And if you don't have a down angle, the strings can almost slip out of the grooves or not have the sound. Same thing with uh, Fender guitars. When they go down the back, you have to use string trees to yeah to lower them down to hold them down, right? So this so is more and more guys are are really playing resonators. I mean, we're seeing them all over the place, right? Mr. Block, are you seeing? Do you get? Are you getting more guys coming in with resonators and saying, hey? Something's I get quite a few, but you know, percentage-wise, it's still pretty low. To yeah. Because uh, now that I know that you'll work on these, <laughs> I may be sending people to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I work on almost anything I can take apart, and do a great job at it. That's for sure. So we've had a couple problems with this one with the volume and the tone control. I still don't understand exactly how they work, um, but. You know, with any old instrument, um, if he can find a way, like you said, if he can find a way to disassemble it and get his hands into it, into it? Yep. he has, you know, been able to fix everything. Yeah, this one, you have to, if I were doing this and the strings were still good and we weren't going to restring it, I would just take the tailpiece off, leave it and just set it aside because mm -hmm. you have to take this whole take the whole cone off out. to get to those. Yeah. But like I say, restringing one of these is a little bit of an ordeal where they have the uh, right, the 12. Yeah. Well, I do let me see this thing. I do have my ways of, of doing things faster. This is a little deal where you can oh, yeah. wind the strings up yeah. instead of sitting there for an hour. Well, you can sit there with your fingers and try to get your... Yeah, well, they have hand ones of these too. Yeah. That on a regular guitar, when I'm stringing, where the peg's sticking up, I wrap it around three or four times, stick the string through, and then I don't have to spend all day winding. It's a nightmare to keep in tune, but once you tune it, it'll usually <laughs> stay in tune for two or two or three songs. That's exactly why I don't play a twelve string. Right. I I can't keep them in tune. I can't tune them, and I don't have the patience to tune them. Right. You know, and honestly. I'm so glad that you take the time to tune your 12 string because there are so many guys out there that they do not tune their 12 string properly and it doesn't sound right. Um, when we started the band, uh, um, Mike Baccarella and I started the band and uh, Mike's a phenomenal musician um, and that is one of his pet peeves. He will not start playing music unless every guitar, every instrument is tuned. Which I, I understand, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's just sort of a basic thing, so, um, you know, I've had this, had this for a while and uh, love this guitar. I think personally that having a really good ear or perfect pitch is a curse. It because can be. <laughs> it is, because you can't, like most acoustic guitars, you, you can't make them play from top to bottom perfectly in tune, yeah. it's just like you can't tune them. A piano perfectly it's an impossibility yeah. but the range is so wide that you don't hear from the very bottom to the and we just you know for me I don't have perfect pitch but I like it to sound good and you know when it sounds good you know when it sounds you can tell when on you're or when it's right you know uh, but it doesn't need to be yeah. perfect I care more about tone than I do perfect pitch. Yeah. Uh, even singers, uh, yeah, I've listened to so many singers that they may not have perfect pitch, but they have such a beautiful tone that it sounds really good anyway. And, yeah. Alright, uh, last last one I brought today. Uh, so I only own two Fenders. I'm, I'm not a Fender guy. Um, so I own a Strat and a Telecaster. This is a Telecaster. So this is a 1982 neck, which is bolted onto a 2001 uh, body. It's I call it a Telecaster, but it's really just a broadcaster because it just has the single pickup. Right. There's no neck pickup. Um, but on our on our first CD, uh, which we call Sister. Well, if I'd known she was your sister, 
The first song, Little Old You, starts with just this this guitar. It's just that opening Telecaster lick, you know, sort of a nod to Keith Richards. Uh, tuned in open G. Um, plays beautiful. Um, I don't play it that much, just because it's not too much my style, but uh, really a great, great instrument. I, I brought it to Mr. Block to do the neck fitting to join them and to make sure that, like he was just talking about, that we had the right angle on the neck and, right. do, and do the adjustment and, you know, bolt it upright and, and, and set it upright. Um, you know, even though these have only one pickup, they have a giant capacitor in here which makes it sound like a double pickup. It actually sounds like you went to a neck pickup. A neck or, so oh really? Switch, yeah. yeah. So it really, it really is a three position switch. There are three different tones, even though there's only one pickup on the guitar. Um, so it's a special capacitor that's not used in well, it, Lowe's? The, or there may be more than one in there. I'm trying, I can't remember. It was the same on that guitar in the picture on the wall. That was oh, one. yeah. So do you have trouble with intonation with this bridge? Uh, I like individual pieces, yeah. but... Uh, Basically, you just kind of go what works the best between as the two. As close as possible yeah, between them, yeah. yeah. When you have more than one on a... And the only time that I'm here really going to see me play uh, the Telecaster or my Strat is um, if my back hurts. <laughs> I, because well, this is much lighter. It's a, it, yeah. it's a fast and it's beautiful. Some of these, I love the colors. Some of these are yeah, heavy. Guitar. Some of these, and, this one's pretty light. Yeah. Um, and Joe, you play a telly on stage for your electric I stuff. I love tellies. In fact, I want to play this one, I think. So <laughs> the next time you get a free Monday night, I expect that you'll be joining me. Bring it on down. Uh, yeah. You got me curious real quick. Uh-oh. Now we're, now this we're is getting what he into does. This is now what he does. Now we're getting into it. <laughs> yeah, see, it's just oh, it's yeah. got a couple in here. Three, no, two. So what I'm used to seeing is the normal. big orange one. Yeah. That's what I'm used to seeing when I open it up. Nice clean wiring. Gosh, that's a nice solder job. It looks nothing like what's on the wall over here. <laughs> I sold those parts to a kid <laughs> when I uh, had a, a retail store and he brought them back and says they're not working. I think he tried to use a match to melt the solder. <laughs> Okay, now we know what's in there. So again, the key with the guitars is, is this. Does it play well? Does it sound good? Um, and then after that, uh, you know, we were just talking before we got started filming and stuff. Like, for some reason, I feel no connection at all to modern instruments. The new guitars, like, I, I really, it... it if you offered me a new Les Paul, I just I would take it, but I'd never play it. Well, you know, we're we're getting to be old dudes, so it's like mm. the older the better. I think the the older the guitar we have, the younger we feel, because we don't feel quite as old as our guitar. Yeah, I don't like the new shiny <laughs> stuff. It's, it, it just doesn't feel uh, so good. So we're here with uh, Chuck Block from Block's uh, Musical Repair, and uh, Chuck, man, when I walk around. The little shop here I see so much history and I know as long as you've been doing this you've had to have some cool dudes in here and worked on some great projects yeah. why don't you give us can you give us a little overview about uh, you know what's happened in the last you know well, we 60 started years out, or so we started out in Lawndale Hawthorne area and the Beach Boys were customers of ours uh, used to rent equipment to do high school dances and Wow then they got going and they'd call me, they were going on tour and they, they would say I need 10 10 foot cords, 10 20 foot cords and back in those days there weren't all these cord companies so I'd be up all night soldering. Soldering cords yeah. together and trying, yeah, yeah, and Larry, the show's got to go on. Yeah, Larry Carlton, the jazz guitar player, used to play, I can't think of the name of the group but they were nationally known and uh, he had six recording guitars, one of every popular thing, and I would yeah. keep his stuff running, and he was recording every day in Hollywood when wow. I was 18. Wow. He let me drive his uh, Harley Sportster with a <laughs> fork. I almost tipped the thing. <laughs> but uh, I've 
worked for not a lot of super famous. Well, my son's pretty famous, Ron Block with Allison Krause. Yeah, Krauss, he plays Station, with Allison, uh, yeah. His last two visits, he had me putting new frets in one of his banjos. So and, does he fly home anytime he needs uh, work done on his gear? No, <laughs> he's, he's in Tennessee, so he has people out there. Yeah. He has guitars I won't work on for major stuff, like he's got a couple of really old Martins. 1937 and 38 D28s oh, worth about a hundred thousand a piece, and if a neck needed to be reset, I wouldn't touch it. Yeah, I, I'd yeah. send him to somebody that's send him to Martin doing or those all the time. Yeah. So give us a little tour on the uh, around the shop. Here. Well, what, basically, what I had a retail store up until 2000, the year 2000. I closed it, so all of these parts back here are probably double what I would have had because I had a set here and yes. I had another set at the store and I used to carry that uh, that little tool see the spinning tool thing with the oh yeah I had a box and I would take that back and forth because there's things on it that cost too much to have you two. don't want to buy two right right yeah. uh, I also used to do a lot more band instruments which is what this bench is for and all those pads and things was your shop in town here? Uh, I was it? had one across the lake on uh, Mission Trail next to the Do It Center. Then I moved to uh, Marietta across from Toys R Us. And then I moved back to Lake Elsinore on uh, Casino Drive next to the Sizzler that's now closed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when I wanted to double my rent, that's when I said, you know what, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it to this. you. Well, you have a beautiful place out here. I yeah. know nobody can see it because we're in the yeah, shop, this, but this is lake, um, lake if you, if you ever actually come out to Chuck's place, it's actually very gorgeous out here. He has a wonderful shop well, and wonderful right place. It's right on the water. It's yeah. a lakefront. I, I love it here, and I, I love, I'm glad we had an opportunity to meet. I, I look Thank forward you. to the rest of what we have going on today. I know... Uh, Chris wants to go through amps, I think, and I think he wants to go through a pedal board, so that's coming up next. I don't and work on amps because I have a rule not to touch anything that could knock me across the room. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff with too much power? Yeah. yeah. All right, we're back with Chris. Hey, Chris, let's talk a little bit about amplifiers. I see you you got your pedal board out here, and uh, which actually looks fairly minimal. I mean, you don't use a whole bunch of stuff, but I think let's start with the amplifiers. Give us a rundown sure. on what you like to use and, and, and kind of maybe what's your favorites and where do you get your tone? Well, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. I'm really a minimalist when it comes to um, the pedals and, and the amps. So I, what I did was I grabbed three amps out of the garage that sort of represent three different things. Every gigging, you know, we're just a working band. We're just a gigging band. Yeah. Every gigging guitar player should own this amplifier. This is a uh, Fender Blues Deluxe Reissue, 60 watts. You can buy this uh, amp on Craigslist anywhere in the country for 250 to 300 dollars. It's bulletproof. You can play any type of music with it. Um, comes with, with the old style chicken head knobs. Um, super reliable. Uh, this this should absolutely be everybody's first amplifier. Um, like it a lot. I'm probably going to play it at tonight's gig. I just throw it in the truck. I never worry about it. Um, the sec the amp in the middle is really something special. There's a guy in Marietta, California. And his, his name is uh, Barry Witt. He owns a company called Corona Amp Works. And Barry is an electrical engineer. And as a hobby, he makes Fender clones, which are point-to-point, -point, hand built um, boutique amplifiers. So this is a clone of a 1964 Fender Viberlux. Um, it's got a 15-inch Jensen speaker in it, a beautiful reverb tank, and it has a boost on the back of it, which um, sort of uh, activates all of these uh, Caesar Diaz type mods. So this is really a clone of Stevie Ray Vaughan's 64 Vibrolux. And we use this amplifier in the studio because it's perfectly quiet and noiseless until you start to play it. So no buzz, no hum, no junk on the recording. Um, very sensitive. I'll play it at outdoor gigs if we're playing like a big outdoor place like um, 
Long Shadow yeah. uh, Winery or Mate de or somewhere where there's you know almost no restraint for the sound. It's a great sounding amp out there, but it's a fantastic amplifier in the studio. But it's loud. But it can be. It's got unlimited power. I think. It, I think it goes up to 110 or 120. Um, then the amp that's down there closest to you. Uh, that's you know sort of the jewel, uh, which I have found after 20 years of searching for stuff. That's a 1962 or 63 um, Fender Concert. Uh, if you'll notice, it's got no reverb on it because in the, in the 60s, the early 60s, Fender didn't believe in reverb. They believed in something called tremolo. And so it's got the tremolo adjustment over there on the far, far right-hand side, but no reverb, so I have to use a reverb pedal. It's all original, and it still has the original two Jensen 10-inch speakers in the back. Um, just, uh, you know, all the amplifiers are two amps. I don't, I don't play solid state. I only play two. Um, Go ahead and spin it around if you want. Uh, so, really great amp. Somewhere along the way, somebody decided to paint it black. I was going to ask about the painting, and, and <laughs> actually I'm surprised to hear that Fender did not have reverb in there. Right. Almost so, every Fender amp I've seen, they, did, they had reverb on it. So, a, a, a reverb really came in for Fender about 1964-65. Um, before that, they were just, like I said, using tremolo or just straight amplification. And you have to remember how Fender started. Fender was making radios, and radios had tube amps. And then when Leo Fender started to make guitars, he had to amplify the guitar, and they were really just modifying radios that they were making in the factory. Right. And that's why it's the Fender Electric Company. Um, that's how sort of it all started. So amplifiers, this is kind of what I run. I don't like big cabinets. I don't like separate heads. Um, you know, th these, this is more than enough amplifier for me. Then pedals, again, you know, I'm really a, min a minimalistic guy. I always run just a four-spot pedal board, uh, never more than that. Um, pedal number one, the white pedal, the tuner, we talked about the importance of tuning before. Um, then I always go to just what I call my dirt pedal, the yellow pedal. I, I've never found anything better than the uh, Super Overdrive. And I just crank the drive or the gain on that about a quarter of the way. Um, I bring the volume up, but I use very little gain. And I'll just use that to get that sort of rock and roll backbeat. Right. Uh, the third position, which the third pedal, which today is the red pedal, um, is the one that I use for all my solos and, and leads. It's usually a distortion or an overdrive. Uh, today it's a distortion. And that's the position that I sort of rotate things out. I really do like this red MXR78 uh, Badass. It's a really fantastic pedal. But I also brought two other ones that I put in that position. The black pedal is an Option 5 Overdrive 2. Um, and that is just an absolutely fantastic overdrive pedal. The company Option 5 is out of Indiana. This brilliant guy, Jay Woods. Uh, builds all the pedals, owns all the pedals. I've met him at NAMM a couple times. Super smart guy. Makes the really high quality product. And then the white box that you have there, the Route 66, if you can find one of those, let me tell you, buy it. Johnny Lang uses this um, on his tours. So on the right hand side, the red light is really just a Ross compressor. And on the left side, the green light is really just an Ibanez Tube Screamer, but they're melded together within one pedal, and it's kind of brilliant when you use it. I was going to ask you about this because I've heard so many good things about this pedal. Yeah, that one's about and 15 years old. They're hard to find. Yeah, you can't you can't find them anywhere. Right. You know, if, but I'm surprised that you don't have this out every day. I, I've heard just that guys love them yeah it's 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 really it's really good um it takes up a little would you use this for lead tone or would you just use it for a rhythm tone or both you know it's kind of it's it's a beautiful pedal to use for soloing for leads um especially when you kick in both the compressor and the overdrive at the same time um it's very easy to dial up very easy to work with i like it a lot I, it takes up quite a bit of space on my board um and like I said, I just like to keep things simple in front of me. Yeah. Um, because I'm also trying to remember lyrics and sing and like, you know. Oh, you the, want to remember your words? Yeah, do, yeah. do the front man thing. <laughs> um, 
Then the only other pedal that I brought today is, and again, you can pick these up dirt cheap. Um, you know, this is a Cryberry uh, 535. And, you know, like I said, once in a while, like we'll play Hendrix or we'll play Stevie Ray or we'll play um, Marvin Gaye. Yeah. Um, and having that wah pedal um, just totally makes the song. It's, it's great. Um, so I would pick one of these up. The key with these, though, is you have to remember this is a filter. And so it's going to filter everything else on your board unless you modify it. And Jay Woods is going to do that for me. He's going to build a true bypass. So your signal will be able to truly bypass the wah, and it won't affect any of the tone on the rest of your pedals. But when you kick it on, you'll get the full effect. Um, and so I think that's why guys will generally put that in the front of their chain. Everybody has a different than, opinion about where yeah, it goes I, in the chain. But um, you, you just have to figure it out for yourself. But for me... Or in the back. I don't know, honey. Right. Yeah. So I like to keep, at the most, four or five pedals in front of me. Um, I do have the brown pedal here. Like I said, the, the old Fender amp does not have reverb on it. So I use the 63 reverb pedal, which is a great simulator. It really is terrific. But there's nothing like the the true spring reverb that's in this amp and the true spring reverb that's in this amp. Yeah. I mean, those are, those are the best. So for me, I would say, you know, that's kind of it. That's the guitars, that's the amps, that's the pedals. Uh, as you and I both know, it all comes from here. There's no substitute for practice. You can't, you can't, you can't change, you can't change suck with all this stuff. You, cannot, you still have to be good. That's right. Yeah. That's right. There, there's no... I used to have, I used to have a pedal on my, on my board that I renamed Suck Less. And for me, that was important, you know. It's right. like, I don't sound as bad if I hit that pedal. <laughs> right. Th this stuff means nothing if you don't practice. Yeah, you have to practice. You have to practice, you know. So. Because you can sound good without all of this stuff. Yeah, and a lot of people do. And you can sound better with some of it. Well, I want to thank you for uh, coming by today, and thanks for coming to Mr. Blocks. And uh, absolutely, thanks Joe. For, it's always great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Here. Thanks for having me out. I appreciate it. And look for the Barstow Prophets' new CD, "Just American Music," to be released in July of 2016.